and a pioneer in personal health informatics at Bayesian Health Incorporated. She is currently serving on the practitioner's board of the ACM and as the vice chair of the AMIA 2022 SPC and the incoming co-chair of the AMIA AI Evaluation Showcase 2023. Previously at IBM Research, she co-chaired the health informatics professional community and was elected as an IBM Academy of Technology member. In her roles, she is actively leading the industry best practice in health AI with a focus on establishing a responsible and ethical AI governance framework and operationalizing AI in workflows. Her dedication has won her recognitions such as the AMIA Distinguished Paper Award, Fellow of the AMIA, Google European Anita Borg Scholar, High Value Inventions, Eminence and Excellence, and Manager Choice Awards. She's on the editorial board of Sensors Journal, Frontiers in Public Health, and the JMAIA Open Special Issue on Precision Medicine. Her commitment has led to several patents and 50 plus technical articles and two new textbooks, Machine Learning for Medicine and Healthcare, and Personal Health Informatics, Patient Participation in Precision Health. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Sabrina. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming after lunch. I see some familiar faces here, and I would love to get connected again with you all later, since this is a first in-person meeting uh, after COVID in KDD for us. Um, I'm Sabrina Shea, as Suju has introduced. I'm a global health AI leader with a decade of experience of operationalizing and innovating in the health AI solutions for improving patient outcomes, care quality, and health equity. And um, I'm serving as the vice chair for AMIA SPC this year. So I'm hoping to see some of you in Washington DC again this year in November. If you are coming, please do let me know. Just we are hoping to build a stronger community connection between the computer science societies of in ACN and American Medical Informatics Association going forward. So your contribution on both sides will be very meaningful for us. We want to know how to serve you better. Yeah, with that say, um, today I want to talk to you more about our journey in health AI adoption. Because we all know that health AI has been talked a lot lately in the news and in press, it aroused a lot of interest. But really, when we talk about the outcomes from those health AI solutions, oftentimes it's suboptimal. So I want to share more about our journey in this space. And I hope that in the end of the talk, if there are action items that we can do together, I can rally your support a little bit more to do it together. And I always like to start my talk with these slides to give you some context of how AI can help medicine. As we know, if when we look at how medical doctors are doing their practice in from the history, oftentimes it relies on a highly intelligent person who has knowledge about all the prior cases, uh, the knowledge that has been accumulated over the years from the intuition on how to deal with a highly variable patient cases and try to extract the rules from there by experience and intuition. That's why that when the computer science um, scientists start joining this mission of understanding how AI can help medicine, there were a lot of hopes here that, guess, as you can see, not any one single person could remember every case before or can um, um, remember all the decisions that have been made by other physicians that had led to different kinds of outcomes. Therefore, the hope has been that computers sitting in the back end can dissect all this information about individual patients and use that to help us. But is that true that AI really can come to rescue here to help us to help these highly variable patient cases to understand them and to help prevent some of the diagnosis errors and other kind of care management issues? Um, we have seen that um, because of that hope. Lately, there are a lot of AI applications in this area that has been proposed 
and actually started to pilot right? um, in radiology, in pathology, and in cardiology. There has been a lot of talks about whether computer will replace radiologists, pathologists in the end, right? And this is on top of this trend that we have seen because the, the infrastructure improvement and the accumulation of data over the years. We have seen in recent years that now with the accumulation of data and with that model size getting bigger and bigger, over, over before we have seen the platform, uh, the performance of model always plateau af even after rounds of training. Now we seem to be at that point because all this improvement on the infrastructure, data chart and model, we are able to start seeing that, that passing the, the, the plateau threshold before and starts getting better and better. Therefore, there were hopes here, right? But if we look, just look at that whole uh, and look at the paper that has been driven by those hopes, we see that there is a tremendous improve nowadays um, in recent years in this area, right? Just one single year, we can count 10,000 papers in this area now because it's so easy now to just download a package and train it on your data and then claim that you have a model you can deploy into the systems. Right, but the problem is there are 10,000 models that already got proven in those paper later. Um, why we didn't see a lot of them being used today? That's really the issues, right? So are we really looking at the right thing now? So that's why I called a phase one, AI phase one, that's the wild west. And I'm glad to say that we now are in phase two already. Like after that Wild West era, there are a lot of hives being generated, but now we are in this era that people start focusing more on validation. And there are different ways of seeking for validation, right? Some of this, you come from FDA, um, you're here today with us, thank you. So um, we know that FDA has already published this guideline for AI ML and has been using the software as medical device process to get clearance of the AI tools so we can start using them in clinics with a sort of FDA clearance, right? Although it's not the same process as uh, rigorous as uh, um, drug and biologics, but th there is some guidelines here now um, that's in that place. And we have seen people start applying for them. Right? So if before 2019, I think there are fewer than 60 approval cases there. Now there are more than 350 already. And also if we look at those cases that has been approved now, it's actually quite interesting. Some of them are already used in the automatic setting like in Europe, literally, there is one case where the X-ray has been processed by, uh, by AI and then given a report directly to the patient to tell them whether the X-ray report is uh, normal or not. Right. So they use it because um, they can prove to the point that there is a certain level of sensitivity and specificity to their model. Right. But, and also in the life science space, we have already started seeing more use of real world data in this space. Um, yet literally there are more than 100 new drug and biologics application that are already getting some use of real world data as supporting evidence. Uh, we, we haven't seen any cases where there is one only using real world data as evidence, but at least there has been this um, direct use of real world data as supporting evidence uh, starting lately. So we have seen more and more things getting validated this way too, right? But there are still so many AI models out there, right? So we saw that there are 10,000 models in the papers each year. It, it cannot be just 350 or 100 uh, models out there that's been validated, right? So what happened to all these other things that if they are not seeking for the approval route? Um, last year, I think there was some press release that has aroused quite some controversies there, 
um, like this uh, Michigan study I was showing here, they were evaluating some commercial algorithm that's directly deployed in the health system by uh, EHR vendor. And they show that without validation, if you just simply deploy as it is, it's actually harmful for the patient outcomes. So what will happen in, in those cases, right? Um, and also because this hype that we have since the sentiment now is getting more critical in AI when it comes to the uh, AI's applications of those. Um, and especially there are a lot of cases lately that has been detecting, about detecting bias in those data. Because as we know that if your models were trained by certain type of data, then it was certainly going to be biased by your data, right? Garbage in, garbage out. But some of them are not really garbage. They just like unintentionally using a particular type of patient as their main subjects. And therefore, when the, in the deployment phase, when people are using that model, if they don't know the context of how this is originally trained, then certainly that will introduce unintentional bias to the field. And we have seen this happen, like in this case, in the pain medication for osteoarthritis, like where we see pain medication actually um, are given 40% less likely to black patients because the guideline has been designed, the kind of assessment of the pen level, the survey instrument has been designed in the 1960s in Britain, in Great Britain with some white local miners. And it has been used since then until now without any um, revalidation. Therefore, all this unintentional bias that has been introduced in the data are now in the model so if we don't have that critical eyes going through it, and if we don't have a set of uh, metrics that we agree to further evaluate those models on, then it can really be potentially harmful. And this is not just for the osteoarthritis. I right? will just give a few more example here. And the, like um, CF recognition, there are breast cancer diagnosis. There are also cases that have been found in the pulse asymmetry measurements. And racial bias is only one kind of bias. They are gender bias. They are bias towards the socioeconomic status. They are bias towards different kinds of subpopulation that the unintentional there that need to be further looked at. And all these are hurting our AI adoption in the back end just because the, and there are no really one set of rules that people all agree on. And in this case, we need to enter AI phase three. Right. And if we put it in the context of the innovation diffusion roadmap, you will see that we are now really just at the very beginning of the health AI adoption roadmap. Right. We haven't even crossed that case and to help us to get to the point where we can start talking about going into mainstream market yet. We're still mainly talking about the early market now and without this kind of community driven agrees upon validation framework, it's going to be harder and harder to persuade people uh, of their worries. So why health AI is so particularly hard compared to many other industries, like in selfless driving, people just use it, start using it and experimenting it, right? So there are certain contexts here we need to also understand better. For example, um, in the healthcare space, we need to understand it's highly personal, right? So, Think about it, in KDD, we love to evaluate models on AUC, right? We always perform better in AUC, then we will say, hey, this is a better model to use. But in the healthcare, it's not true. Even if you have a better performing model in terms of overall accuracy, it can be pretty bad per, per patients. Right? So think about individual patient cases, and if you can earn the trust from your clinicians about why that models really work and help them to make decision on the ground, 
that is not going to be adopted. And that's, uh, that's the, that kind of personal context that change the thing about evaluation here that we need to think about. And it's not just performance, it's also about calibration. Sometimes and on your model can perform very well overall, that you see that in AUC, but when you are at a certain operating point, it's a very, um, you, you have to decide at some point to, how did you control that trade-off of how, whether you are going to over alerting your clinician or you are going to care about having your model more specific and be able to detect um, the things that you need to detect. And we, we had to make those choices also by being able to make those metrics more transparent and that's will be going beyond what's traditionally being evaluated. And also we talk a little bit about the regulators earlier, right? So in this space, the regulation hasn't been clearly defined and therefore we are still constantly evolving those guidelines. Just the, uh, this year, HINS and AMIA, uh, where I serve as vice chair for, we all have specific proposal for FDA to start looking into this regulation more in a continuous learning fashion. Previously, if you just deploy the model and then, um, and then validate it there, it's fine. But oftentimes, what we see in the field is that you have to use the model trends elsewhere and then deploy it in some new settings, right? So in those cases, are you going to need to revalidate it every time you have a re new deployment and if your subpopulation construction or composition are different from your original one, would you be needing some adaptation process to do it, right? So all these are currently still not, not in the uh, set stone yet. So that still requires a lot of discussion in the community. And also, um, I guess for this community, um, if you might be the most familiar with the interpretability literature. So there has been a lot of talk about data bias, concept drift, and model bias. Right? How do we deal with those? Just take healthcare, um, for example, like if the quitinine value Creatinine is a waste product of kidney that you can use to measure your kidney function, right? So it can be coming from, you, if your creatinine value is bad, that can either mean that you have chronic kidney disease or it can be you have acute condition like sepsis, right? So how did you then um, incorporate that uh, knowledge, additional cl clinical context and knowledge and avoid the, the misuse of your data? And also, there are often time data missing for reason, right? That that will um, that that's resulting in some concept drift. Said that the practice guideline just change, that they they change their lactate order guideline. So you will suddenly see that there are a period of time there's just no lactate order. So if your model previously used lactate order as a feature and you use it to help you to detect certain clinical need, then now you are screwed. Right. So with, without all this understanding of the, what's happening in the care protocol, uh, young, then you will often expose yourself to the harm of those unintentional uh, results. And then that, that lack of trust there result in those AI hype that we have seen earlier is really also a factor here that makes AI adoption pretty hard in this area, right? So the, Clinicians tend to now have more critical eyes towards the results coming from AI machine learning model. So at a decision point, if you want to convince them to use what the AI models comes out from, then they need to have high trust in it because every day they are running in a very high speed, right? So on the ground, they are going every hours, every minute there is a new task. So if what you are introducing is a new app, it's not going to work. They don't want to open up another app to look at your results and trying to understand what the AI machine learning model is doing decision for and then use that for their decision on the ground. It's not going to happen. So without trust, none of this will be adopted. And then in the end, the result is what we see in the post-COVID era that the clinician already burned out 
So this will just turn, turn into something that will uh, give them even more burnout scenarios. Yeah, therefore, in this phase three, we need to look at some more different approaches, not just simple validation as phase two will do. Right? We need to start really rally the community to start coming up with the community-driven engagement to help us to redefine what is accountable AI is for. Um, and we have lately seen more regulations in this space, like EU in 2000. 21, actually, uh, following the GDPR, they have now the, edge, the proposal for regulating AI machine learning models in this space. And also FTC also proposed earlier in June that they are going to start penalizing companies that put our algorithm there that will have the discrimination harm. Yeah, and so for us in healthcare, this is what we think that will, we will need, right? So at least we need to think about this from two fronts. One is on the front end, we need to have this with uh, clinicians as uh, what we call automatic uh, care automation, uh, intelligent care automation. Um, so this is more about having that interactive loop set up for them so they can give you feedback and use it directly in the model adaptation phase to let them know that their input has been appreciated in the model adaptation process. So that's a way to win trust, but that's not the only way. But without this, it's really hard to even start them upon seeing the values out of the decisions coming out from the AI ML model. Right. And on the other end, on the back end, you will need your adaptive AI framework to help you to really enable that adaptation process, right? So, and in this community in KDD, we talk about a lot about adaptation, and that can go into this framework in the layer, base layer, but that's not the only thing. Usually what we see is that maybe 5% of work is on the technical ground. And then going from there, your 95% of work will then starting from there to start getting the humans in the loop now to help you to start adapting, really starts adapting that with their eyes on your decision in every single case and then from there you will have a chance to start having your models incorporated in real world setting. And that has to be not just like um, we deploy this model and just go take a look. It has to be seamlessly integrated into the workflow without needing the clinician to open up another app. It has to be all in one place for them. And for them, it's not just like looking at the alerts. For them, it will be more like a clinical colleagues they are working with. And if you want to build trust, like think about it in your workspace, if you want to build trust with the people you work with to let them trust your dec the decision you made, so eventually they take that on um, without having to think too much, you have to have that process incorporated in your framework. And that's why we told the, this um, adaptive AI for intelligent care auto automation process. And I don't need to go into details here, but this is basically showing you that flow that has to happen on the ground for this to really taking place. And on top of that, then you also need to incorporate the behavioral change framework, right? So nothing happened overnight. So this has to be built into a habit formation framework. And with that, then that gradually become the muscle memory. And going from there, AI become part of the workflow. So let me give you an example of a safe sepsis cases to see how we do it in, on the ground and what kind of results we get. So uh, for those who are not familiar with sepsis, Sepsis is the, the 11th leading cause of death in United States. 
even greater than prostate cancer and breast cancer combined. But the good thing is it's preventable. If you detect it early and give the right interventions, it can prevent a lot of deaths that unintentionally happen today in our inpatient setting in hospitals. Yeah, but the problem is also sepsis is a condition that doesn't have clear guideline for diagnosis, right? And if you ask 90, like this Harvard study, they ask 93 academic experts who should know something about sepsis and give them seven cases, but they just couldn't agree on whether one is sepsis or when one is not in a way that will eventually make sense to make some rules out of it. Yeah, therefore, that's why the traditional model has failed in this space previously to provide really useful results that will win trust from clinician to, for their adoption. Right. So if you think about it, it makes sense. The traditionally um, AI tools, if you don't have too much clinical knowledge, you just incorporate the raw data as it is, like what we just mentioned, creatinine, you incorporate the, the values of it. Um, for lactate order, you include it as an event in your data, in your temporal sequence. Or you will say, hey, um, uh, you don't, this is the organ dysfunction, and you will just say, oh yeah, there is one organ dysfunction or not as a binary flag, right? All these are incorporated in that way. Um, and then you train your sepsis model to detect um, previously, usually what people do is use billing code as a way to find sepsis cases, right? But prior studies has also shown only one third of sepsis case actually have a billing code. So some of them say, hey, then let's use antibody order as a label. But antibody orders are only being placed in the hospitals after hours after sepsis onset. So the physicians will only notice that hours later and usually it's too late, right? That has been the problem with sepsis. So how, if you just use all these targets, um, the prediction targets naively, that's how you will fail. And also for learners, right? We talk about a lot of different bias earlier, racial bias, gender bias, social economic bias. If you train your data without thinking about the learner you are using and just use the best performing models out there as the model you will then deploy into production, it will fail too because then a lot of time in healthcare, you are deploying a different setting, although it seems to be the similar hospital settings, but in the end of the day, every hospital is a bit different from one, uh, from one to another. Therefore, this kind of traditional thinking, you have one, one model and deploy it everywhere will fail too. Yeah, therefore, in, in this space, uh, we really need to think harder um, not just the research inputs, as we said earlier, right? So all these clinical contests need to go in. How did you interpret creatinine? How did you interpret lactate order? Are there other clinical knowledge that need to go in? How did you interpret organ dysfunction? Are there specific things that lead to that that also need to in your knowledge base in order for you to now make sense of those organ dysfunction altogether? And also on the high quality targets, Part, right? So this is a lot of work. So process, process need to go in to identify the real phenotypes that can help you to detect sepsis onset instead of detecting those after fact order or after fact building codes that will not take you anywhere for this particular problem you are trying to solve. Right. And also for learner, you really need to have the learner that not just best performing in terms of the aggregated performance like AUC, you need a model that can be attested to be robust to the data shift, to the concept shift, to the bias that underlying that, to the best of our knowledge. Right. And this has to be going on top of the continuous monitoring fashion so we can keep adapting with that intelligent care automation framework we just talked about. And just to provide you some data 
point empirically for how much that helps. This in the one, one hospitals that we are deploying the models on, we see that if you just use the traditional method to do this uh, with the, your structured data, with your traditional target training with the standard learners, then you will see that at the same, t same levels of sensitivity, like here, if we just look at 90% sensitivity here, you are suffering like one, only one third of the performance that you could reach with the method that incorporating the richer inputs, the better phenotypes for targeting, and with the learner that can be attested to be robust to data shapes. Um, yeah, so, and also on top of that, if we further add causal inference as a way to help us to remember the history of the medical, from the medical history of the patients, including the care protocol, and compare them um, in a way that orange to orange, apple to apple in the potential, potential outcome framework in the what if scenario, instead of just using it as um, the traditional machine learning fashion, then uh, we further see that we can improve the, out, improve the prediction like here in this case to keep the tra trajectory of whether a certain dialysis event will happen for a single patient um, with a significant performance improvement. And also um, on the methods for reducing bias, right? So this is another thing that we, we ask people now in the field to report on. When you are doing the model evaluation, it's not just about model performance in terms of accuracy anymore. You need to report on the calibration um, and all this other bias detection related matches and, and incorporating the bias reducing mechanism in here, then we can further show that we are able to help build the model that not just uh, without degradation of performance, but be able to be robustly deployed in environments that are different from the originally training environment. Yeah, and all this combined together, that it's like five years of research already, right? But then what's amazing is that then in, on top of that, if we add that behavioral change framework and the intelligent care automation framework we talk about, then uh, we are able to reach, like in the study that just published in Nature Medicine last month, that we are able to show that in that multi-site studies in uh, across 750K patients and with the 4,000 providers, in incorporating in the use of the AI tools, we're able to reach 90, almost like 90% 90 of clinical adoption. Uh, and this is the kind of years of research then being built into a thoughtfully built out change management process. And on top of that with the adapted AI, all the methods incorporated together. And on the result front, we are able to show that with that incorporated, we see that 5.7 hours of reduction time to the bio, antibiotics. That means that the, for the most severe cases of sepsis, now the physicians on the ground will have five more hours to take the interventions they had to take in order to avoid those deaths that could possibly be resulting in from the undetected sepsis. Right, and in this case, we show that actually in that two and a half years data, we see we see 80% of reduction of the mortality rate, and um, also shown on the overall wellness status improvement by the reduction of the length of stay for those patients that we have observed from that two years of data or AI adoption. And this together for the 250 beds hospital will mean at least $2.5 million of saving. So just think about that, the kind of impact on health outcomes and care quality and health equity. Um, this is the nature paper we have. Um, if, if anyone interested, uh, we can send you a copy. 
Yeah, and also about from here, then we are in phase three, right? And we propose this new uh, accountable AI framework that we hope that everyone in the field will from now on more report it on together. Um, there are certain guidelines that has been already discussed with the expert group uh, in different setting as well. Some more for clinical decision support, some more for the care transition of care setting from inpatient to outpatient. And there are also other working groups now doing this together. So that's why that earlier say that if you are in KDD, you are the ACN community, but you also are interested in this domain, join us in the discussion in AMIA later November. We will welcome your input. Yeah, and with that say, uh, just a few more call for actions. Right? So we are based in house, we are company. Uh, we, in this field, we feel that we are not really, we, we really shouldn't be uh, one single player play setting. This is really something that we need to rally the community to do together if we want to find the best practice and in order to for us to go from that phase one, phase two, now to phase three, to really establish trust in the field with other people or stakeholders also in this ecosystem, then we need to do this together. So join us for some of this best practice discussion. We have been doing this in AMIA, we have been doing it, this in HINGS, we have been doing it in some many other healthcare set um, specific a conference, but we want to do more in the computer science community too. So join us there. And certainly if we, this is the field that need the best tech, best engineer, the best medicine people to work together to make it work. So if you are interested, join us directly too. And in this KDD in particular, um, we have been hosting the DS Health Workshop. This is the fifth year. I have some co-organizer here. Um, thank you for coming today too. And if you want to join us in the organization, organizing of the workshop next year, yeah, please let us know. We will welcome your input. Every year, we try to select the emerging topics for us for next year to focus more on, depending on what the community feels like what's the most urgent issues to be talked about. And in the AMIA front, uh, we are hosting, I'm going to co-chair the AI evaluation showcase next year. So this is the kind of uh, community we are setting up to help start collecting and curating the best practice examples. So if you have been doing the AI work and you have been evaluating it, please uh, submit your proposal to the AI showcase in AMIA2. This is going to be three stages things. We are going to ask you to not just report on the technical performance, and even on the technical performance, it cannot be just accuracy. It has to be all throughout, the softly considered throughout those bias detection framework, right? But we also want to see then what's the next step for AI adoption here how to the usability and workflow that you are thinking and what kind of health impacts you will be measuring in the, in, the, in the workflow. So we could really use this framework and start collecting the, the in data inputs of how people do things. Right now people just do things so widely different. So it's hard to con con convince the whole community to start re reviewing, um, to re using one set of standards. So this is the kind of thing we want to do, start by setting up this community to collect examples and have those people who are doing evaluation to talk to each other, right? And I don't need to go into more details here, but we were doing this for the phase research framework here for evaluating AI. And if you join us, then we are hoping to have your input here for what other things that we also need to talk about. Yeah, so with that, I will conclude here to say that health AI adoption is really not easy. And we have been through this for almost a decade now. So we have seen so many failed cases, including IBM where <laughs> I was at before. But we are really saying that this is really the era we feel that will be different now as we have seen more better examples of validation to win trust in this field. 
And with this framework, we are hoping that we will start building a more accountable AI together in this healthcare area. Thank you. Yeah, and join us if you can. Hi, uh, thank you for sharing your visions and your current work. Uh, I'm, I've been doing my PhD for the same domain, uh, and I saw a lot of uh, good AI-driven approaches that predicting disease with astonishing uh, accuracy. But I think the main issue is the how we ac actually can implement this into the uh, practice setting. Mm -hmm. And just to uh, focus on the sepsis case that you shared, the, Clinicians are already like complaining about the alert fatigue even within the device they are using, like low DSAT and like the yeah. heart rate alert. And we are actually trying to add alarm on their workflow. So um, and there was, as you mentioned, there was a, a different startup doing different uh, clinical prediction, and they weren't able to survive till now. So I'm wondering what is the Bayesian health uh, the strategy to adopt uh, this technique to the actual practice setting uh, outside of the FDA approval thing. I'm, I'm more curious about how you, uh, are you going to convince clinicians that this is the right way to go. Right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, very good question, right? That's why we spent years building our experiencing, which is also presented here for that intelligent care automation framework because we really believe that it's not just a one-step approach. Right? So you don't just train model once and deploy, it will not work. The clinician really need to trust your models when they see their input matters. So in the beginning phase, there will be a change management process that's actually quite labor intensive. So this means that every input they look into, right? So they are going to, we have this interactive interface they, they give us the input, and we need to make sure their input really got used by the model. So this requires a careful scrutinization of how those inputs help improve the model, right, and which direction it's taking. So there will also be on the model refinement side, it's not just automation, it's actually a lot of time you have to really look into how that model get tuned to different places uh, by after incorporating their inputs and make sure that that's not giving you unintentional harm. And also making sure that they see that how their inputs in, after get incorporated into a model that the model is now performing differently, right? So usually the best case scenario will be they do this and then they say, this is not sepsis. And then next time, if the similar cases comes up, we can point to them, hey, you see your inputs really matters. Now this time, this similar cases come up, it doesn't get labeled as alerted as sepsis anymore. And you need to do this a few more rounds until they become muscle memory. Then they will just use it without thinking, just like you trust your clinical colleague. Yeah. But without that process, that in initial labor intensive process, we find it very hard to win trust. That's just our take. Hello, Sabrina. Hi, great talk. Uh, I'm Xavier Madrin from Curai Health. And shameless plug, I'm going to be talking about AI oh, and healthcare. Yeah, yeah. I saw also your here objects. on Thursday. So you're all invited. But uh, I wanted to ask you. Um, you mentioned uh, causal reasoning as one, I would say, aspiration mm -hmm. of AI in healthcare. And um, we would all like to get there, but I want to ask you about your take and your experience, particularly because of the name of your company, Bayesian Health, right? Um, there's two aspects to it, right? One, on the one hand, we know that a lot of decisions that doctors make, actually most of them are not causal, and they can't really explain why they made them. On the other hand, some causal models ta have to sacrifice accuracy, right, in prediction, and you have to make a choice, like do you want more accuracy or do you want to 
have some uh, causal reasoning going on. So what is, what is your take there and what is your approach? Yeah, luckily, actually, when we train the model with a causal inference framework, we actually, yeah, luckily, in this, at least in this scenario we are looking at, didn't suffer performance degradation. Mm. So at least we are lucky on that front. So all we need to now think about is which one we can help us to win trust more, right? And apparently, the one that with the coastal framework usually wins, right? But in the end of the day, we actually didn't just dictate that in our model selection. We incorporate all of them. It's just like you have a panel of experts in, in your clinical panel. You will, each of them are seeing the different perspectives and they are learning from their different backgrounds. So the coastal models learn something perhaps the other model didn't see that give us that better understanding of the, what, what will happen in the different care protocols. Right. And now we can go back to our clinician to tell them, yeah, if we turn this off without this care, switch to this other care protocol, then this will be what, ha what will happen. And they can use that to, they can resonate with that because they see that happening in their clinical setting every day, right? And if you are able to convince them with that data-driven evidence, usually you will win trust. So that, that's, uh, well, we didn't use it directly as like one model we selected, but better use it as a way to build a context to convince and win trust. And do you have any uh, hypothesis on why the causal model performed better in, in it, this it's setting? Re, it's not always better, but at least the same, right? Yeah. Um, in this case, we have all the, we still have all the features incorporated, right? So model, um, COSO or not, it's in this case, just whether you use that in the potential framework to, in your formulation or not, right? But you still have all the necessary features mm -hmm. there. You didn't lose a, lo a lot, but instead you have additional information here, which helped you to be able to match the subgroups, apple to apple, orange to orange. Right? I think that's the, that's the fundamental thing the outcome, potential outcome framework trying to do. They help you to match to that subgroups of people that you need to match to in your scenario in order to come up with that what if prediction. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Hi. Uh, today and also during the data science for air care workshop, you mentioned that you made an observation that everybody does things very differently. Could you maybe give an example? Uh, Not that I disagree, but I would be curious to, to hear an example. Thank you. Uh, you mean patients or clinicians? Uh, I think you were referring to practitioner of uh, AI in healthcare that said they approach things very differently. Sorry, yeah, I'm trying to remember how I say. <laughs> so you mean that you want to know more about what I say about AI practitioners? Thing? I think you were referring, for example, to what you saw in the EMEA AI showcase right, that said right. that everybody oh, yeah, approached yeah, things I, very I differently. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the, um, so what I'm trying to say there is that right now everybody evaluating things differently, right? So um, if because this bias issue has comes up a lot, so now there are multiple metrics people have proposed to use to help you to surface the bias. Therefore, some people are reporting on this set of metrics, some people are reporting on that set of metrics, and in the end of the day, it's very hard to compare them across the board. And not to mention, not so many of them are reporting on usability kind of metrics and the actual outcomes, right? So these are the kind of practice we want to encourage more, and we want to start by looking at what people are doing today. Right, so submitting the proposal, we, we then start seeing everybody's, uh, how they plan to do things. And then with, eventually with this set up of the community, then people have a platform to start talking. Then from all this we have observed so far, what should be the right set of metrics we all agree on using going forward. 
Yeah, that's the kind of community engagement approach we're trying to take here. Right, yeah, so this is, um, yeah, I don't know if I have a slide on that, but I feel that that's really something that's very domain specific, right? That's why I didn't mention any particular method of doing that, because at least in this context that I was representing, for example, sepsis, and we are doing this for many other conditions too, for every single cases, a condition, actually we do need to go in to incorporate all the clinical knowledge again. And, and sometimes it's very different one from one to another. Yeah, but, but in general, if we really want to generalize a little bit, yeah, it's about incorporating knowledge base, at least the clinical guideline into your data. And then also trying to um, in it also incorporate all the interpretation of your clinical value instead of just the raw value. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. And yeah, join us in AMI if you can. Thank you.